Major funding for Immortality Now was provided through an educational grant from Hotsi Vitamins. Founded in 1993 by Dr. Stephen F. Hotsi, Hotsi Vitamins is committed to delivering only the finest quality vitamins and supplements to meet your patient's needs. Now offering customized vitamin packs, Hotsi Vitamins is making it easier than ever for your patients to get well naturally. For more information, visit client.hotsivitamins.com. Hello again, this is Dr. Ron Klatz with Immortality Now. Dr. John Monaco is our guest, and we're going to talk about hormone replacement therapy. We're going to talk a little bit about the, the many benefits of hormones and some of the risks, and you'll be surprised to hear about that. Uh, Dr. Monaco, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. You were speaking at uh, your presentation about uh, their actual dangers associated with uh, some forms of hormone replacement therapy. And that's interesting because we hear so many great things about hormone replacement therapy. It's almost rare that we hear about negatives. And as a matter of fact, it's so rare that we hear about negatives. And um, I, I certainly, for one, kind of dismiss them as being fear-mongering. Mm -hmm. But uh, you suggest that the, there are some concerns, especially for women. Maybe you could elaborate on that. Sure. Well, I mean, overall, Bioidentical hormones are very safe, and the literature supports that. Um, however, recent literature, when we look at hormones and cardiovascular disease, there may be certain patient populations that might be at greater risk if they take hormones, particularly the time after menopause. So we know that when you compare premenopausal women to postmenopausal women and men, the incidence of atherosclerosis is very low in premenopausal women indicating that estrogen does exert a protective effect uh, on the blood vessels in women. However, after menopause, if women don't take hormones, then over 10 or 15 years, they actually catch up to men with atherosclerosis, and the number one non-cancer killer of men and women in this country is cardiovascular disease. The problem is that uh, as a woman uh, ages after menopause without hormones and she develops atherosclerosis, especially if she has a mature atheroma or a plaque, the covering on that plaque is a fibrous cap. And the danger that we run into with cardiovascular disease is disruption of that plaque, that fibrous cap and plaque rupture, which then releases compounds into the vasculature that lead to thrombosis and occlusion. Well, estrogen in uh, a premenopausal or perimenopausal patient and a postmenopausal woman who starts estrogen immediately at a time of menopause continues that protection. However, after about 10 years, uh, that protection may, in some women, um, uh, be lost. So the estrogen can actually disrupt that plaque, weaken that fibrous cap, leading to more uh, plaque rupture and thrombosis. So that's a risk in certain populations. How high a risk are we talking? I mean, are we talking about a 1% risk? Are we talking about a 10% mm. risk, a 30% risk? Yeah. I don't know that I can give you a number because there are, of course, other factors. Uh, for instance, their lifestyle, uh, stress. Do they have high cortisol? Do they have other metabolic issues mm -hmm. like diabetes and hypertension? So I think those types of things will obviously increase the likelihood of that happening. Mm -hmm. But the literature seems to suggest that we lose some of the protective effects of estrogen, and it's actually a different mechanism than the protective effects. So it's kind of interesting. But um, I counsel my patients that this is a possibility. This is what we're seeing. I still think that there's benefit to giving uh, postmenopausal women greater than 10 years estrogen, but we also address the other lifestyle issues. And I think that's the key. You can't just give hormones and avoid. You really have to address these other issues. So I think that's all part of it. But you don't see this uh, similar problem associated with hormone replacement therapy for men? No, actually, there's, there's a lot of good evidence that, that properly prescribed hormones, and, and again, um, it's physiologic dosing. The dose that your body typically produces in your mid-30s on an average day um, giving physiologic doses of hormones um, will actually cause protection to men. We know that all causes of mortality in men are increased with low testosterone. So the studies uh, on prostate cancer, for instance, everybody is concerned about prostate cancer, but there's really no good study that says that testosterone causes prostate cancer. In fact, there's a lot of evidence to the contrary. Yeah, to the opposite. 
And what about uh, dosing? Do you find, uh, you know, some people suggest that intermittent dosing is more effective because you give the receptor sites a chance to kind of cool out a little bit. Absolutely. And there's no question that for women, transdermal hormones are much more physiologic. And once we get a patient balanced, I typically will give them a hormonal holiday, so a day off. Uh, to give those receptors a chance, we rotate sites so that the uh, the absorption is is more consistent. Uh, with men, I've been very disappointed with topical. I have guys that are on topical and doing very well, but the vast majority of my guys were not seeing the benefits. So I've come up with a compounded formulation where I use two different forms of testosterone, and I give it twice a week, small doses. So they're not getting the very high spikes that you would get with once a week therapy. And they're staying in the, the pretty much in the physiologic Is range. Is it sub Q or IM? It's IM. It's, it's IM. IM. Yeah, it's it, they're getting 30 milligrams twice a week, so they're getting 60 milligrams a week uh, on average, and that's a physiologic dose. That's about eight, eight and a half milligrams per day, and we produce between five and eight milligrams a day. So you don't need a lot of hormone to get the health benefits with these hormones. Mm -hmm. How about pellets? I'm not a big fan of pellets, um, mainly because. Um, once you once you put them in, you own them for three to six months. Yes. Um, but I'm, I'm not saying that it's bad to do, but there's, there is one caution with pellets. That man has to be on some other form of testosterone for at least six months so we can check his PSA and make sure that he's not he doesn't have an occult cancer of the prostate. Um, because if you put those pellets in, this this man has an occult cancer of the prostate, then you've got six months where you're you're stimulating that cancer. So uh, I think there may be a place for pellets. I personally don't do them. I get very, very good results with, with uh, the therapies that I use. How about the uh, testosterone precursors? That's a great question. Um, I always screen uh, my men, even if they're over 60, I've still found some men that um, we can give other things to stimulate testosterone. So I'll do an LH, luteinizing hormone, that stimulates the testes to make testosterone. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times mm -hmm. I'll give, especially the young guys, young guys that want to preserve fertility, you don't want to suppress their spermatogenesis with testosterone. So most of those guys will respond to HCG or Clomid or something like that, uh, that will stimulate their own endogenous production of testosterone. So that's a very good possibility as well. I see. And what has been your experience with regard to hormone replacement therapy as an anti-aging therapeutic uh, in and of itself? Do you find it to be essential, hopeful, helpful? Do you find that there's some people who can do without? Or I mean, what's been your your clinical experience mm. over the years. How many people have you had on, or do you have on hormone replacement therapy? Well, I, uh, and when I say hormone replacement therapy, I'm talking about a full spectrum hormone replacement therapy. I have therapy. thousands of patients on hormones. Right. I, I don't think that That's you... That's why I asked the question. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't think that you can talk uh, about anti-aging medicine or age management medicine or longevity without talking about hormones. Um, I find that every person is a candidate for hormone therapy unless proven otherwise. And I find I have very few patients that, don't, uh, that aren't candidates for, for hormones. So when you talk about the other benefits of properly dosed hormones, you're talking about cognitive preservation, you're talking about cardiovascular protection, you're talking about bone preservation, maintenance of muscle, maintenance of um, lifestyle, quality of life, energy, sleep. Um, sexual function, I mean, let's face it, all of these things are important to us. Spirituality, um, mood, those things all contribute to our longevity. And if those things aren't there, if they're lacking, then you may, you may live to a, a, an older age, but it's not going to be a healthy older age. So I think hormones are absolutely critical. You can't, you can't talk about, about anti-aging without mentioning hormones. I agree with you entirely. Tell us about estrogen, especially the the breakdown or the uh, the different the various forms of estrogen. Estrogen sure. one, two, three. Sure. There 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 are three forms of human estrogens. There's estradiol, which is the main premenopausal estrogen, and, and that's eighty times stronger than estriol, the weakest of the estrogens, or E three. So when you look at a premenopausal woman. She is primarily estradiol or E2 unless she's pregnant. Then estriol is the predominant hormone. And that may, 
um, explain in some part why women who have had term pregnancies who have nursed have a lower incidence of breast cancer because E3 is protective to the breast. It stimulates different receptors in the breast that are protective. Uh, postmenopausally, a woman is more estrone. So we can look at metabolism of estrone, which can give us clues as to where her estrogen is going. And at 80 plus percent of breast cancers are diagnosed postmenopausally. We want to know that. So when we uh, replace estrogen, we use a balance of E2 and E3. We don't need to give estrone because E2 will convert to E1, um, and they both will make E3. E3 is unique because it doesn't back convert. So we can use estriol in the, va in the vagina for vaginal atrophy, along with a little bit of testosterone or DHEA, and heal the vagina without worrying about that estrogen being converted to, uh, to something else. Now, uh, when you look at metabolism of estrogen, there are things that we can do to change that metabolism nutritionally. Uh, one of the classics is the cruciferous vegetables will favor the metabolism of estrone to a safer form of estrone. So balancing these hormones with progesterone. Progesterone opposes estrogen. Uh, estrogen stimulates the um, estrogen and progesterone receptors in the breast. Progesterone comes along and downregulates estrogen receptors so you don't get this unopposed estrogen stimulation of the breast. So even if a woman's had a hysterectomy, progesterone is indicated. Now, why do you think there is so much debate and argument uh, from uh, the uh, uh, mainstream uh, medicine circles, the gynecologists, the endocrinologists, uh, basically on the wrong side of the equation so many times, in my opinion, mm -hmm. uh, trying to, uh, you know, trying to smear hormone replacement therapy, trying to make exaggerated claims for the risks of hormone replacement therapy. What do you think is behind that? You know, I think that's an interesting question. I think there's a lot of things behind that. Uh, number one, most gynecologists get their education about drugs from the drug rep. Mm -hmm. So the drug rep will tell them what the drug company wants them to know. The second objection I get very frequently is there's no data. And I tell them that there is a ton of data. It's in their literature. It's in the Green Journal for OBGYN. It's in the Journal of Endocrinology and the New England Journal of Medicine. But they're not reading that. And a lot of times the, uh, there's a lot of terminology confusion. When you see an article that says estrogen increases the risk of breast cancer, well, that's true with a qualification. If that patient is seeing unopposed, non-human identical estrogen or having a synthetic progestin, that is true. But when you hear uh, a positive benefit, um, they'll name the drug. So they'll, they'll name a drug like conjugated equine estrogens will decrease bone loss, which is also true. So there's a lot of confusion in the literature and in, in the lay uh, literature because they kind of lump all these estrogens together. And really my job is to try to educate doctors and the public to say you have to understand when we say progesterone, progestins are not progesterone. But you ask most gynecologists and endocrinologists and they'll lump them together, say that progesterone increases blood pressure and increases the rate of breast cancer and so on, and that really applies to progestins and not progesterone. And I think there's a lot of fear. I think doctors are afraid to step outside of the box because it's a big scary world outside of that box. And they're afraid to, um, to go against what might be construed as something that's outside the standard of care. Well, thank you, Dr. Monaco, for joining us. My pleasure. God bless. Thank you, and God bless you. Immortality Now is made possible in part by Hoetze Vitamins, now offering customized vitamin packs. For more information, visit clients.hoetzevitamins.com.